everybody in the mainstream media has been talking about how we are no longer going to have a recession. In fact, the recession has been canceled. So far, there's no evidence of a recession. We don't expect recessions, particularly in the US or really elsewhere. But the data would suggest they are completely wrong. In fact, I think we will go into a recession very soon, and it's not going to be a soft landing. It's going to be a hard landing, potentially even a financial crisis. So I know a lot of you are asking yourself, OK, George, well, when do you think we will go into this recession? Well, let me be very precise. I think there's a 95.3% chance that we go into a recession by October 1st. How's that for being specific? <laughs> You're not going to see that on any other YouTube channel, but I'm going to tell you how I'm coming to that conclusion in three simple, fast steps. Step number one, let's go over how the U.S. economy actually works. And it is true, this is an oversimplified version but it helps you understand the concepts that we'll be talking about within this video. Okay, it all starts with the consumer. You guys have heard many, many times that the U.S. economy is 70% consumption. So on the left, we have some of the stores or the consumer shops. We'll call it Home Depot, Target, Walmart. And on the right, we've got some services, bar, cafe, lawyer, accountant. You guys get the idea. But we also have the banking system. The banking system is extending credit to the consumer, and we have asset prices, as you know, very important to the U.S. economy, along with government spending. More on that in just a moment. But we also have to realize that we don't produce much stuff in the United States, so all the stuff the consumer is buying at Home Depot, Target, Walmart, coming from places like China, where they are sending us the stuff they produce, and we are sending them dollars. So let's assume for a moment that this current system is in a state of equilibrium, where the consumer is pretty much living paycheck to paycheck, which 61% of them are. More on that in step number two. But they're basically getting paid from their employers, which are the places which they shop. So that's why I've got dollars going to Walmart, Target, Home Depot from the consumer, but then dollars going right back to the consumer because these are employers. Same things with the bars, cafes, and the lawyer, the services side of the economy. Okay, well, if this is in an equilibrium, they're basically living paycheck to paycheck, what happens if you take away one of these sources of income to the consumer? And let's just use an example, something like stimulus checks. And most of you will say, George, that's old news. Stimulus, that was like so 2021. Right, but what you're not thinking about is the expense side of the P&L. So you're just looking at the revenue. But what you have to remember is that there are a lot of expenses, such as student loans, that the consumer hasn't had to pay in three years. So effectively, that is like getting more and more free money from the government. And we see this in all these metrics such as excess savings when you compare how much savings the consumer has today versus what they had in 2019. So let's just go through a thought experiment where the amount of money going to the consumer decreases from your drunk, insolvent Uncle Sam. <laughs> so if we have those dollars, poof, go away, well, what does that do to the entire system? All right, well, that means the consumer is going to have less money that they're going to be spending at the bar, cafe, lawyer. So we've got to delete that dollar. Well, that means that the bar, cafe, lawyer employs fewer people. So we've got to delete that dollar. Well, if they're employing fewer people, then that means the bank is going to have a harder time lending. There's less credit worthy borrowers. So now all of a sudden, we delete that source of wealth, let's say, and because the consumer has a house, the equity of the house goes up, they sell it to another consumer, which represents more purchasing power. That's why we've got a dollar going down into this house and then right back to the consumer in aggregate total when they buy or when they sell. But if they're not getting that credit from the banks because the economy is starting to wobble, and it all started, remember, with not as much money coming in from the government, then 
There's not as much money going into the houses. There's not as much money going into the back pocket of the people that sell. Well, if that's the case, then the consumer's really going to be squeezed and they're not gonna have the money to spend at Home Depot, Target, Walmart. Therefore, these entities will have to lay off more of their workers, which are the consumers themselves. So this last dollar in the system goes away. And you can see this actually playing out in other statistics when you scratch beneath the surface, such as the youth unemployment rate in China skyrocketing up to 21%, so high in fact, that they came out and said that they're no longer going to report the data. Why is it that their youth unemployment rate is so high? Because the manufacturing sector in their economy is crashing. Why? Is it because they don't want to produce as much stuff? They don't have the capacity? They don't have the workers? Absolutely not. It's because they don't have the demand coming in from places like the United States. So less stuff and therefore less dollars going into the global economy as well, which creates a feedback loop that goes right back to the United States and also impacts the U.S. consumer. Oh, time out. I know most of you are saying to yourself, okay, George, I get most of what you're saying, but that last bit where, I don't know, there's not many dollars going to China and somehow that impacts the United States and the U.S. consumer, how do you figure? Okay, well, we've got to remember that the banking system in the United States is very important to the consumer. They need that constant source of credit. But this banking system in the United States is also dependent upon the banking system outside of the United States. We call this the Euro dollar system. I'm sure that term is very familiar to a lot of you. But if those banks in the Euro dollar system start to contract their credit, they start to freeze up, there's less dollar liquidity, that means that the global economy is going to have a significant problem, which will then impact the domestic banks in the United States, which will impact the average Joe and Jane consumer. That's how I'm connecting those dots. So the bottom line here is you can see that if we just have one leg of the stool start to wobble, such as the amount of purchasing power that's going from the government to the consumer, the whole entire house of cards can come crashing down. Step number two. Now let's go over just some of the data that leads me to the conclusion that the United States is headed for a recession very soon. In fact, maybe October 1st, and this recession is going to be severe. It's not gonna be a soft landing. It's gonna be a hard landing, if not something even worse. First and foremost, let's go right over to CNBC, and they say 61% of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck, even though inflation is cooling down. So to help you get your head around this, let's go over and break these numbers down by specific income group. So they say low income workers have been hit the hardest by the price spikes, as you'd expect, particularly with food and other staples, since those expenses account for a bigger share of the budget. Roughly three quarters of consumers earning less than $50,000 and 65% of those earning between 50 and 100,000 were living paycheck to paycheck. And this is as of June. I would argue that it's most likely a lot worse now. And this is based on lending club. But now's the point where I hope you're sitting down. And like I say, on these videos all the time, it is officially stiff drink time because it's easy to understand how the poor and middle class is getting squeezed by the inflation, how their purchasing power is going down, the living paycheck to paycheck. But it's not just the poor and middle class. This report goes on to say that of those making $100,000 or more, 45% of them say that they also are living paycheck to paycheck. So the point is, it's not just the poor and middle class that are struggling right now. Even the top income brackets are seeing their purchasing power evaporate as a result of what's happening in the economy. Speaking of what's happening in the economy that's leading to more and more Americans living paycheck to paycheck, let's go right over to the San Francisco Fed's website. This is a recent blog post from August 16th titled Excess No More, 
dwindling pandemic savings. Let's go straight down to their first chart because this pretty much says it all. Go all the way back to 2016 to today's date. This blue line represents the trend in the amount of savings. So prior to the Cerveza sickness, this trend was going up just slightly. People were saving a little bit more money in aggregate total. But then as the stimulus checks came out, as you would imagine, and people didn't have to pay their rent and they didn't have to pay their student loan, et cetera, the amount that people had in savings skyrocketed way above trend. But look, right at the end of 2021, maybe the beginning of 2022, that number goes negative. And since then, Americans in aggregate total are saving a lot less than they were prior to 2020. So why are they burning through their savings and why are more and more Americans living paycheck to paycheck? Well, we talked about this briefly a couple minutes ago, but here's a chart that gives you a visual of what we were referring to. And this is real average hourly wages. So everyone is saying on CNBC, Bloomberg, the mainstream financial media, all these talking heads that we're not going to have a recession because the consumer is resilient. Look at all the nominal wage gains that they have had since 2020. The unemployment rate is low and therefore employers have to pay people more and more and more to get them to work. And this is good for the consumer. Well, it's not that good when you consider the rate of inflation. It's not just the nominal wage gains. It's the overall purchasing power that matters. Look at this chart. And you can see starting in, let's call it March of 2021, the real average hourly earnings, when you adjust for inflation, goes steeply negative. We're talking about negative 3.4%. And it remained negative all the way to March of 2023. And that's just because this is where the chart ends. <laughs> I would assume if you took this out even further to where we are today in September of 2023, this red line would still be negative. Okay, well, let's go to another chart here and we'll go back to 2008. And you see that in 2009, we had uh, some significant real wage gains. Why? Because we actually had deflation. You guys remember back to 2009, it was either Q1 or Q2 where prices actually went down, not disinflation, but outright deflation. But since that time, even when you consider what happened here with negative real wage growth, and let's call it 2011, overall, the trend was up. And then as you can imagine, it really spiked in 2020, very consistent with the first two charts. And look at what has happened since then. We'll call it March of 2021. I mean, we haven't seen anything like this as far as the reduction of purchasing power going back at least 15 plus years. We're seeing negative real wage growth in places like Australia, but also in Japan, in Europe, and to an extreme here in the United States. Oh, but wait, there is more. Remember I talked about October 1st as being a specific date that you should be paying attention to. Why? because this is when millions of Americans have to start paying their student loan once again. So at the beginning of this video, we talked about how the stimulus payments were really impacting the revenue side of their profit and loss, if you wanna look at the individuals having a P&L. But we also have to consider the expense side. A lot of them did not have to pay rent. Now they're probably having to pay rent now, but they still don't have to pay their student loan. So as of September, that interest is starting to accrue again. And starting October 1st, they have to start making payments. So let's dive into the numbers and see how many Americans this actually impacts. According to Forbes magazine, roughly 43 million Americans have student loans. Okay, well, let's see how that breaks down. In fact, I'm gonna ask you, the viewer, a quick question. How many of those Americans, those 43 million Americans, do you think are making their payments right now? 10 million? Maybe 15 million? Try 500,000. You heard right. Out of the 43 million Americans that have student loan debt, only 500,000. 
5,000 are making their payments right now. So think about that. What is going to happen October 1st? Well, if we do the back of the napkin math, you can see that this breaks down by 6.4 million of them are actually in school. Okay, fine. So they're not going to have to make those payments. Then you've got 1.6 in a grace period. You've got the 0.5 million or 500,000 that actually are making their payments. You've got 3.1 million deferment, 24 million in forbearance, and 5.1 just in flat out default. So if you exclude the 6.4 million that are actually in school, and if you include the 1.6 million, the 3.1 million, the 24 million, and then we'll just exclude the people in default. Now you're looking at roughly, we'll call it 27, we'll call it 30 million people approximately will have to start making their payments October 1st. So then the question becomes, okay, well, how much will they have to pay? Well, the average borrower, the average monthly payment is 400 bucks. So think about that. Is 61% of Americans and 45% of Americans making over $100,000 of living paycheck to paycheck, how on earth are they going to afford an extra $400 a month? The answer is they're not going to be able to afford to make those payments or they're going to have to take spending away from some other place. And that goes right back to what we were talking about in step number one, when we were going over the overall United States economy and that being centered around the consumer. If the consumer has less and less purchasing power, that means less money going to the businesses that are going to have to start laying off more and more people, increasing the unemployment rate, which means the consumer has less purchasing power. You go into this doom loop or this self-reinforcing process that takes us straight into a recession if not something worse. But the story doesn't end there. Let's pull up another chart of a very interesting statistic. This is GDP plus. Now, what this does is it kind of averages out two metrics. GDP, you've all heard of that, but also GDI, which is a representation of gross domestic income or an approximation. And usually GDI is an even better recession indicator than GDP. So what this chart does is it kind of averages out the two of them, which is represented by this call it reddish, orange, brown line. <laughs> those of you in the chat or those of you in the comments can tell me what this actual color is. But we can see this going back to the GFC. And if we look at an even longer dated chart, going back to the 1960s, the 1970s, we can see that it's very consistent with recession, meaning that once this line, this orangish brown line goes under the zero, once it goes negative, you're almost always in a recession or on the brink of a recession. And if we fast forward to today, you can see that once again, this line has gone negative which if history is any teacher, it would imply that we are right on the brink of a recession, or we could even be in a recession right now as we speak. Step number three. Now let's address some of the arguments from this guy, your friend and family member, Fred. And you all know who I'm talking about. You all know somebody or a lot of people that would fall into this category. This is the guy that back in 2019, 2020, when you were talking about a central bank digital currency and how this could be a very big deal, and how this is something we want to avoid, they were the ones that were saying, oh, what are you talking about? You tinfoil hatter, you conspiracy theorist. We'll never have a central bank digital currency in the United States. <laughs> and they're also the ones that will always say, the government would never do that, fill in the blank. And they've been saying this since 2020. The government will never lock you in a cage. <laughs> the government would never force you to inject some sort of foreign substance into your body. I mean, the government would never censor you. The government would never try to claim that people who were always right were spreading 
misinformation and disinformation. And these are the exact same people that are telling you now, oh, the United States will never go into a recession. I mean, that yield curve thing, that's old news. That doesn't work anymore. The yield curve is dead as they sit there and tell you over and over and over again that you're some sort of doomer. And then they always follow it up after you give them fact after fact after fact, data point after data point after data point, or maybe you share this video with them. They always follow it up with, oh, well, <laughs> uh, yeah, but you know, this time it's different. Why? Because the economy is incredibly resilient. <laughs> and they'll say things like, oh, the unemployment rate is low, or corporate profits haven't dipped that much, or real rates, yeah, they're positive, but they're not that positive to where it would really impact the overall economy. As a matter of fact, I think the person who sums up this view very, very well is none other than Joe Biden himself. Editor, let's go to a recent quote from our president. Overall, Americans are living more abundantly than they ever have before today. More than two and a half million new jobs were created just in the past year alone. That's the biggest percentage increase in nearly 20 years. People are earning more than they ever have before in history. Despite this record of achievement, as we turn to the future, we hear once again the familiar voice of the perennial prophets of gloom, telling us now that because of the need to fight inflation, because of the energy crisis, America may be headed for a recession. Let me speak to that issue head on, he says. There will be no recession in the United States of America. And I'd like to emphasize where he said, there will be no recession in the United States. Now, maybe some of you caught what I was doing right there. You see, that quote, or part of a speech, was not from Joe Biden. That was from President Richard Nixon when he was addressing the country in January of 1974. And I would like to point out that the United States officially went into a recession in November of 1973. So as the president was saying that we will not go into a recession, we were actually in a recession. And oh, by the way, the yield curve was inverted back then, just like it's inverted today. History might not repeat, but it sure does rhyme. For more content that'll help you build wealth and thrive in a world of out of control central banks and big governments, check out this playlist right here, and I will see you on the next video.